Hey. Yeah. What? Grab your bootstraps. Yeah, let's scale your growth. Here's the truth, Jack. We'll reach the globe, unveil the next. Daniel, what the fuck? Earn your digits. Boom, burn, you'll get it. See, this is factual. Fuzz will show. Learn to fool with candid capital. This is a candid capital interview. In these episodes, we host industry business professionals involved in the global tech ecosystem to discuss various topics related to tech, global economy, and building sustainable businesses and investments. Welcome to the Candid Capital Podcast. We're here in Canada, the day of the Beyond Blockchain event in Ottawa. Um, and we have a special episode where we're covering D Pitten. Decentralized Physical Infrastructure with Kate Withers, the co-founder of Functionland, a Web3 startup. Thanks for coming. Yes, thank you for having me, Josh. So for anyone who's listened to this podcast before, um, this is not a Web3 podcast, but I tend to talk a lot about Web3 just because that is the tech vertical that I'm generally interested in. Yeah. And so this is a special treat to have somebody who's a bit of a, an expert on the, the <laughs> deep in field. And... Um, yeah, I mean, uh, this is this is something I've been trying to set up for a while, and uh, finding an expert in Ottawa was a bit challenging, so we imported one from Toronto, so thank you again. Yes, well, thank you very much for having me. Glad to be here. So usually how we get this, this started mm -hmm. is the origin story. So what I would like to know is your entrepreneurial journey, and then wherever that took you, how did you land in Web3? Oh, all right. So I am Kate. I was originally born in South Africa, and I also lived in Eswatini, formerly known as Swaziland. Um, I've always been connected, interested in computing and, you know, playing, being connected to the larger world and being able to get information. Um, so I moved to Canada just before high school um, and then studied at the University of Guelph. I studied agriculture. I also studied at Michigan State University, um, agriculture, and then came back to do a PhD in um, so agriculture with big data and statistics as well. And then after that, I led, went to the Ontario Centers of Innovation. So I had the chance to work with over 75 startups, really de-risking them and working on their investment readiness, and then actually helping them raise their first seed round in conjunction with institutional and angel investors in Ontario. Um, I then started uh, my own construction marketplace, a B2B SaaS, where I got very deep into building product within the Amazon Web Services sort of ecosystem. So it's a really good background, I find. Um, and then I met Kayvon. So Kayvon is a, my dear friend and co-founder at Functionland. And um, he is just he, such a knowledgeable person on AI. And I just could not keep up with him. I couldn't understand where he was going, what he was thinking about. So I myself actually went back to school. I went to Durham College and I did their postgraduate program in um, like strategy and implementation of AI. And I just also then caught the bug of AI. So we formed a company called Assisted.ai that went through the next AI program. And then we since have pivoted to build function land because as we were building, we realized we actually wanted to tackle the problem of monetizing open source developers. So um, we started function land. We've been working on that for a little while. We've raised over 1.4 million USD. We've commercialized our nodes. They're out there in the world. And I can't wait to tell you more about that. Okay, so you, so your construction company mm -hmm. was that uh, serving Canadian market or in South Africa? Oh yes, that was very much here in North America or Canada, and it actually it still exists. I call it sort of a cockroach type of company where it exists. It's doing more um, acting most sort of like a lifestyle business where there are deals and transactions occurring, but we decided not to sort of scale that technology to be a true marketplace as we were building it. Have you done any startups in South Africa? No, no, no. I moved okay. to you when I was quite young. But um, I am seeing, obviously, a growing um, interest in DPIN and computes and blockchain in Southern Africa and South Africa specifically. I'm looking at Cardano and how it's making its inroads into Africa. So I know there's going to be um, a place for me to go back there and build. Yeah, I would say, like, probably in the last 18 to 24 months, I've been just running into more and more African investors mm. and startups. Um, I've run into a couple of groups in Brazil, but they're based okay. in, in, in Africa. Really? Um, primarily in South Africa. There's a couple other mm -hmm. places as well. Um, but they're, they've done investments in Brazil, for example. Interesting. Um, okay. And Love then, that flow of capital. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, it seems like they've, they've joined the game is, yeah. is how I would put it. I mean, mm -hmm. they, I, I still view them as an emerging, um, tech ecosystem. Mm 
-hmm. but before it was just localized. And so now it seems like there's been some traction, maybe some wins. And so I'm running into them all over the place. Yeah. Um, Same with the collision. Um, Collision had some had some investor groups there. They had some accelerators Mm -hmm. as well exploring the place. So like I'm excited to see what happens there. Yes, I am, too. (laughs) um, I'm definitely watching that market for sure. Yes. Um, So you mentioned AI a few Mm -hmm. times. Um, I usually avoid talking about AI in most (laughs) of my uh, podcast episodes. I mean, I'm an AI fatalist, so I have had that conversation. Mm -hmm. But um, because you've mentioned it in your work with data, I'm just kind of wondering, is that something that you're actively building or pursuing into your deep end projects? Yes. So I'm a part of a startup called Saiwa.ai, and we're building um, a product in ag tech that uses computer vision imagery. And then we're actually being able to map species or issues on a plant-based level. And so people say, you know, how does that connect into what you're building at Function Land? But I ultimately believe that farmers are one of the largest providers or um, they create so much data and they have very little ownership of their own data. So, you know, I see Function Land as a conduit to actually going back into agriculture. So on the computer vision side, you know, there's been tons of video imagery being created, actual images being created, and then where do you store these images? How do you actually do feature extraction on them and analyze it to actually give important analysis and information back to farmers so that they can make good decisions on their farm? So we are involved, I am involved in a government-funded project to look at how can we actually look at herbicide-resistant weeds and how can we map them and help farmers get ahead of them. So that is actually big passion of mine, mostly yeah, on the computer vision side. So for the agricultural component of what you're building, will it be a centralizing force or will you be building it, building in a decentralized force? Uh, and just to understand the question is, yeah. when you look at the more advanced countries, mm-hmm. it's a centralizing farming production process in, in a lot of different areas. Yeah. And when you look at emerging markets, it's a lot, I would say, like small farms. Yes. And yes. so, you know, the centralizing force tends to change and shape the way food production is mm-hmm. done, also in terms of, I would argue, quality. Yes. No, good question. I think when we think of blockchain, especially here in Canada, it goes immediately to the idea of traceability. Okay, how are we going to trace this product from farm to fork? It's an interesting use case, and I like it, but I don't love to spend lots of time there because I think it prevents people from thinking of how blockchain and decentralized infrastructure can be used beyond the traceability argument. But I'll just say, you know, at the moment, in terms of centralization, all of that data and all of that information you're collecting from IoT sensors on farms, from computer vision, from cameras and videos, um, or from the telematics from the equipment right now, goes into like an S3 storage bucket in AWS or Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud. So, um, and also actually there's a big tech in terms of agriculture. So big ag says, okay, let me take your data from your farming equipment and then I'll sell it back to you in the form of analysis. So data is going from farms directly to big ag, who's paying big tech, and then the farmer is having to pay to get their own insights of their own farm. So in terms of decentralization, I think there's interesting projects like Ocean Protocol, um, and there's these new, a new um, AI conglomerate of companies, Fetch AI, Singularity, and Ocean Protocol have joined together, where maybe farmers can create a, a um, share of data, like shared data set, that's used and sold to these companies, and then they're all paid out and rewarded for their contributions to that data. Or maybe that data is actually used to build an algorithm, and then algorithm can be sold in a data marketplace such as an ocean protocol or streamer network, and then these farmers and whomever can get rewards from their contributions. Okay. Um, I mean, I was just kind of thinking of it from in terms of, you know, I used to be in the coffee business. Oh, really? Yeah, and so... You know, it was a lot of, I would say, smaller lots. And so oh, absolutely. it's, it's yes. not, the thing is, if you go for scale, mm-hmm. um, there's problems with disease because you you end up doing... Um, like monoculture. Yes. Yes. And so the country that I was dealing with didn't have this problem. They didn't have the leaf fungi. They didn't have any of that because mm-hmm. that's not how their production's done. At the right. at the specialty coffee tea level, it's yes. just like, you know, I own this land. I walk into the forest and I decide to put like nine plants here, and then yes. I put fifteen plants somewhere else, and it's in yes. with the rest of the 
the vegetation. Yes. Um, yeah. So I'm actually a part of um, an organization called Nobellum, where we, our mission is to back 100 STEM-led businesses that are co-founded or led by black founders. So one of these companies I'm helping coach is called Cornucropia. That's exactly addresses this problem that you're talking about. So we're running a proof of concept this summer right now in Ghana where smallholder farmers are growing cocoa um, and then they're actually aggregating that at the warehouse level and then allowing these farmers to take part in um, large transactions or sales into North America or Europe, but then making sure that each farmer is rewarded their actual fair share of what it was to grow that crop. Um, and so we are looking at right now, you know, fiat payments, and it's not an easy problem to solve. How do you actually take that money to escrow and then pay it to each farmer in a decentralized fashion or just make sure that they get paid? Um, and so we are also looking at taking that to crypto instead of fiat to facilitate that payment, those payments. Okay, you know, that's interesting. Yeah, we can talk about that more offline <laughs> <laughs> since you didn't copy. <laughs> um, yeah, so... You know, specifically Web3, Yes. you know, um, what was kind of your entry point into it? Was it just from sort of a, <clears throat> a technical evolution from when you were discussing your origin story? Yeah. Or did you, I don't know, did you end up at a side event? Did you end up at a conference? <laughs> were you at uh, ETH Denver or something like that? Like, how yeah. did it happen? So when I was at the OCI, I was working with a lot, a few businesses that were working in the blockchain side of things. So we were learning blockchain in sort of a train the trainer kind of fashion. Um, and then I started to get interested in a few projects like Ripple and Stellar. So originally in 2016 or 2017, I saw these and I thought, wow, they're getting rid of like this remittance payments problem or they're looking at, um, you know, how these payments are all made now in a centralized fashion. So I bought those tokens really early on using a Jax wallet. <laughs> so I've kind of been playing in this space for a little while. But then when we built um, Function Land, we wanted to, again, monetize open source developers. So we took it back to first principles and we realized that to do this, everybody had to have their own piece of hardware on their desk. And then we were going to facilitate, we are facilitating storage and computes in these units, but um, how do you assure that these units are online? Who is keeping their node online and looking after people's data? How do you compensate these people for storing each other's data? So we needed sort of a ledger and we need to make sure that there's that compensation and incentivization layer on top of just this network. So that's how um, we got very interested myself in Filecoin um, and their technologies out of Protocol Labs, um, IPFS, the Interplanetary File System. I thought that was just brilliant. Um, and so I, but I think I really caught the bug at ETH Lisbon. So I went there, wow, there was Web Summit and ETH Lisbon. So I should have been at Web Summit playing with the SaaS companies and, you know, Web2, but I just was enthralled with all the Solana, you know, side events and um, all the IPFS events that were happening, Filecoin, Near Protocol, just caught that bug. And then ever since I've been deep in it and um, I'm part of the like, Web3T Toronto community and the Near Toronto community, and especially the Solana Toronto community. Those are some really fun events. So I just really want to stress this to women and people like myself, when you're involved in the Web3 community, you can go anywhere out to an event and you just have built-in friends and you can nerd out and just talk about <laughs> just <laughs> technology um, over Coca-Cola, you know, it's not even alcohol driven, which I really like. And then I can travel. So I can travel to, you know, Portugal, um, and to Barcelona, to um, the, World, the Mobile Summit there recently. And just, again, built-in community, built-in friends, you're looked after and it feels just so empowering. And I can't imagine my life without Web3. Wow, I'm not surprised there's a Portugal connection. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is DeepIn? All right. So, um, we'll be doing a presentation on this later on. So, DeepIn is an umbrella term, and the actual acronym stands for Decentralized Physical Infrastructure Networks. So, people tend to think of that as very the physical side of it so iot sensors and then how for instance can um, a weather station be feeding data into a larger network that others can use and how could someone put up a weather network or in the case of um, helium which we'll be talking about as well helium hive mapper this is the idea that people can for instance with um which is what i'm thinking of with uh anyways you can let's say take the telematics data out of your car and be contributing, demo, contributing that into the network and being paid in reciprocation. Or there's nodal networks where you can use your phone to provide um, 
Bluetooth networks and be able to really increase that Bluetooth coverage and be compensated for running that nodal net node on your phone. Then hive mappers, so people have dash cams and um, some sort of telematics where they're mapping the world and creating the next Google Map API. So people tend to think of those and they get a lot of attention because kind of low barrier to entry, people can get up and running and be a part of that network. Well, I think the concept of hive mapper is very exciting. You do, it, yes. Yes, because there's an oligopoly on maps. Yes. There's like four or five companies that really kind of own you yes. know, the mapping of the world. And that's why, you know, we have Uber Eats, which is like 30% fees. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, it's true. I mean, I think there are some open source mapping uh, products out there. I do. I mean, I think there's potential for it, but they're going to have, it's a good, you know, does that business case make a ton of sense? And I would, I agree with you. And I think there's big potential. They have something like 145,000 nodes out there already, which is impressive. But um, I want to see really strong demand for those like mapping think, APIs for that. I think what could be like the game changer is if it's real time geo data all continuously and it's in some sort of open system mm -hmm. so anybody can really plug their business into it that yes. requires it that changes it that removes the need for google maps that removes the need for like centerpieces like you know uber and others yeah. because like just like in, a general example is not to date myself but i remember getting pizza delivered from, yeah. the, pizza, <laughs> from the actual pizza place for sure yeah and you know it didn't cost even with tip what you have to pay for now if you're using DoorDash, if you're using yeah. Uber, if you're using any of them. But they don't have a choice if they want to do delivery. Right. And COVID kind of was a forcing function for having to do delivery. Yes. So, you know, we're not there yet, but I think like a real-time decentralized mapping system Yeah. Um, that any of these restaurant owners could easily plug in. It can't be complicated. Mm. Yes. Yes. Um, but, you know, like that's just like an example of what I think would be interesting. And there's several different businesses. Yeah. And then that just puts Uber back into the ride sharing business. Right. But even, I mean, all those ride sharing and Uber Eats and Skip the Dishes business models profitable today, actually. I mean, they're at yeah. huge risk of not either reaching or maintaining profitability. And again, a lot of that's because they're paying huge SaaS cloud fees. And again, like to set back to Google Maps, maybe APIs and so forth, and having to download those costs onto you know, B2B to see those consumers at the end are getting the Uber Eats delivered to them. But I think my back to like, what is deep in? So it is an umbrella term and it has that. And then there's also what I think is much more important where the real true value will be is in these digital infrastructure networks. So today with SaaS, you need to have your security, your cloud, your computing, your networking, your content distribution. Um, and so the decentralization of those services is what's really interesting in Deepin. So it's actually decentralized cloud um, infrastructure. That's really interesting. But I just want to caution people is that Deepin is also like a narrative. So for those retail crypto investors, you know, Deepin is the hype one right now. And so there's going to be projects who are not strong, who don't have a future, who don't have tight tokenomics or true technology, who are going to try and ride that hype cycle. And also not every Deepin project necessarily needs a token. So tokens are very tightly tied to Deepin projects and they should be, but you've got to be careful of um, some of these companies just sort of riding the narrative wave. So I just tell people Deepin is a strong future. It'll probably underpin and be one of the most successful aspects of Web3 that will exist far into the future, but be careful of those parading as Deepin who are not. So I would say one of the excuses mm -hmm. for Canada's infrastructure is always that it's too expensive and we're too spread apart and yes. diverse, you know, um, geographically. Mm -hmm. Do you think Deepin could solve this? I do think so. You know, I was, I watch Helium really closely. So Helium is one of the projects that we really looked as like a trailblazer in our space. They're one of the first to really um, sell and get nodes in people's homes or offices, you know, really geographically distributed across the world. And they were initially starting out with this IoT LoRaWAN network. So making LoRaWAN a much stronger network. So, you know, if you're a trucking company and you need telematics on your fleet, you know, there's going to be more of those LoRaWAN nodes as you're traversing, you know, North America. Um, but, you know, I'm wondering, there's already a LoRaWAN network and people were already putting up nodes. So is there true, true value there? But recently they've pivoted to... Not pivoted, they also have a 5G network 
coverage that they're doing in combination with Freedom Mobile. And um, I've been skeptical about that just just to see. You know, I want to make sure that it's the real deal. But then at, con at uh, Collision, someone came up to me from the States and said, oh, they run a 5G helium node at home for cellular coverage, and they switch to that when they're in the vicinity of their home and then switch back to their cellular provider when they're not. So I thought, you know, maybe this is something to be said, you know? So I guess with that is, then how does the spectrum licenses work? Like if you're, if you're a, a startup doing yes. a decentralized version, you still have to get, you know, the licenses and there's a whole bidding process between the big yeah. four or whatnot. So like, I think that's with some aspects of connectivity. I think with like LoRaWAN, it's always yeah. been sort of more of a open with, protocol with without one? licenses. Okay. Yeah. But again, yes. So Helium had to partner with, um, I think Freedom, Freedom Mobile, who already had, I guess, the license yeah. to then add on that 5G coverage. And then we have to make sure, is it actually 5G? I mean, even our actual telecommunication companies selling and charging us for 5G, sometimes it isn't actually true 5G network coverage. But, you know, on the train right here, I really struggled with internet from Toronto to Ottawa and, you know, getting through Kingston. I was constantly switching between the Via Train Wi-Fi and my own mobile Wi-Fi, and I struggled the entire time. And you think... This is how the politicians come to and from, you know, work and so forth. You know, I really struggled from a productivity level just on that train ride. And that's not even that rural or that remote, right, between Toronto. That corridor should be really well networked. So I think there is a role here. And I was listening uh, just quickly to a story about the story of Nortel, right? So Nortel was maybe ahead of its time in trying to put all these um, internet cabling together, but there was companies like Hawaii who were focusing on much lower cost infrastructure into um, developing countries. And now we look at some of those developing countries out <laughs> there. Um, infrastructure is really strong. If you're speaking to your like remote developer in Lahore or who's on vacation out of Lahore in a rural remote place, their connectivity is usually stronger than mine up around the GTA sometimes, right? So I think there's definitely room for improvement and Deepin could potentially play a large role in here, especially if it's incentivizing people who are contributing nodes and compute and the infrastructure itself. Yeah, I remember, was it, I think, six or four years ago, they were mm -hmm. still doing signature imprints for credit cards on that train. <laughs> um, like, it's still yeah. relatively new that yeah. you can tap there. Well, now they don't and take it, cash. It, and it, and it, does, it, doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't always work, too. Then they just, like, don't offer anything. Yeah. No, I'm... Um, yeah, it's a funny mix of hybrid of technologies, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's there's a couple projects I've heard about in Canada for r rural areas. Yes. Um, because the large operators can't make it feasible to really help yeah. rural areas. Yes. Um, you know, and, and they ha they ha they're very, I guess you could say, cost sensitive on, yes. on their CapEx. So yeah. I would... Carrier One is one of them... Yeah, I think, yes. I think, yeah, I think, yeah, they're I think, great. I think I'm a big fan I'm of Carry One. Yeah. But, you know, going back to farmers, a lot of these farmers are running um, their machinery. They need GPS. They need autonomous units helping them with their seeding and spraying. And they do not have the internet. And yet the ag tech products assume that they have connectivity. So a lot of them went to Starlink and they're running their tractors off of Starlink. My own friends I went to school with. So it took a South African born, Canadian educated US builder to actually put give them internet connectivity via satellite in space to their farm in southwestern Ontario. So I guess one of the questions that I get, and I really don't have a good answer. Yes. I just, you know, blockchain will figure it out. Um, <laughs> is with all this decentralized sort of, we'll call it networking type of businesses, mm -hmm. How are the how is the data secured? Like if an individual can just buy a product and keep it at home to be part of the network that they're they're building out to receive their yeah. incentive and whatnot, how is any of the traffic that's going on their device, like how is that data secured? Yeah, and it's a really good question. Um so this is why, for instance, I'm a big fan of so Protocol Labs, for instance, has built this IPFS that I speak of. They also have a product called LibP2P. Um, and there's another project called UCANS, which was uh, developed in combination with a company called Fission. But the idea is to use um, very sophisticated types of like encryption. I won't say all these different names of encryption, but also um, and zero knowledge proofs, for instance. So we need to be able to have one, let's say I'm a node that's storing a specific type of data and your node is querying my node through a remote procedure call, RPC. Um, I need to say, so my, this node needs to say, yes, I have your data, 
but without, ex without um, explicitly stating what that is. So then, for instance, with zero knowledge proofs, I can give back an answer within cryptography that gives you the information and the reassurance, yes, they do have my data, that's for sure it, but it's not by ex exposing what that data is. So with function land, for instance, we have um, an FX files decentralized application adapt, so you can save your files to FX files on your desktop or on your phone, and then you store it within your hardware unit on your desk, and then it's replicated five different times for that redundancy factor across five different nodes, but in an encrypted fashion. So right from when it's being, um, before it's being transported, it's encrypted and it stays encrypted while it's in transfer mode. And then when it gets to its new storage um, unit, it is again, remains encrypted. Um, I do think it's so, I mean, some companies and projects are very cognizant of this. They're building it with cybersecurity or network security, data uh, security right from the get-go. But you know, there is a worry. So with IoT, everything, just in the Web2 world, IoT sensors, if you have them all around this room, they're, they're a different conduit for a cyber hack, potentially. So we have to ensure that it's not just throw up a thousand nodes and they're all going to be secure. It could actually be yeah, new venues for vector attacks. So we need to make sure that each sensor is, in fact, secured. And um, we really rely on, again, libp 2 p But even at sort of our token or our data infrastructure, we have a layer three, which we're, so functional land, we're using um, Substrate, which is a Polkadot technology. And then at layer two, you can choose which layer two you roll up to, whether that's Algorand, Kudos, and Polygon, actually, which we built our test net with. But then at that layer one, we're still rolling up to that, the ERC20 like Ethereum so token. Is the, so the vulnerability wouldn't be the device? Like, uh, for example, let's say that I'm just a hacker network. I'm like, hey, guys, everyone buy, like, one of these devices. Let's get into the yeah. network. Is is that not an issue with the decentralized? It, it could be. It really depends, okay. right? So for I'm not speaking. I don't know enough about this. But let's say with Helium, with Helium, if you want to integrate into that network, you go and buy a device from a third-party company. So there might be 30 companies that make, like Bobcat, for instance, that makes a Helium-ready unit, right? Or with Hive Mapper you're buying a dash cam potentially either from them, but generally these can be third party units. So where's that third party unit? Who made it? Where was it made? Was the chip that is inside it made somewhere that is secure or was that chip could potentially be, have a vulnerability? So in the, in the case of function land, you know, we went and chose a specific chip and then built out our own chip set and very closely monitored the manufacturing of it and design of it. And we were very intricately involved to ensure there are no vulnerabilities. But it's not something you can just take for granted. You've got to really be doing your due diligence. Okay. Um, I guess with that, let's just jump into function land. Sure. Um, maybe you can just give the rundown or that two-minute pitch on, yeah. on what function land is, what problem you're solving. And then I'll probably again ask you another security question. Because <laughs> Just because we already kind of started it. Sure, but like I mean, after, I'm not a cybersecurity but, you know, expert. But, like, you know, maybe after understanding a little bit more and I yeah. can layer on more specific questions that you, you might have. Um, yeah. Describe. So with Function Land, we are building a decentralized cloud alternative. So an alternative to the big tech clouds you see today. I've mentioned Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, um, and Amazon Web Services. So we have a hardware unit, which our community called FX Blocks. And this is a physical unit that sits on your desk and you interact with it with your smartphone. So with Function Land, we are very much mobile native focused. We know that, that UX, that UI of how people interact with um, SaaS or applications today and how they're going to interact with them on Web3 is very critical for adoption, removing that friction. So we've started with... Um, FX photos, so where you store your files, your photos of your family, your videos, and FX files, where you'd store your files, and we're working on sort of a data layer as well. But essentially, right now, your options are to store your files and photos with one of these cloud providers, or you can have like a hard drive attached, you know, daisy chained into your system at home, or a network attached server like QNAP or one of these. But, you know, if you're far away on the, let's say you're in, um, I don't know, Indonesia on the beach and you want to show your new friend your photos of people at home, that utility is very difficult. So with FX Photos, anywhere you are in the world, you can open up your smartphone and have access to your files and photos that are stored at home on your device, but then also stored safely in the actual Fula network itself. And then 
While your unit is sitting at home, it's auto mining our native token, Fula. And you can use Fula to um, buy extra storage or actually even purchase and download applications that are built by developers. And then these developers would actually be paid with the Fula token for what they've built. Um, but the real novelty here is that if, when my unit is at home, so for instance, I was lucky enough as a founder <laughs> to have access to the one that has one terabyte of storage built in. So then I went off to Staples and I went and bought some Seagate, so Western Digital um, storage units. And then I attached that into my FX Blocks unit. So now I am contributing a total of three terabytes to the network of both storage and compute. And so um, our blockchain, which is like a proof of resource based blockchain, can come check. I'm still providing three terabytes. My node's been up and running for a long time uh, consistently. And I'm paid rewards in proportion to the uptime and how much storage I'm providing to the network. So right now, you know, Collision, I kept showing people my um, FX Blocks app, which is which you, the application you interact with your FX Blocks with. And every time I opened it, my rewards had gone up. And I was just so excited because it was a lot of engineering work to get our testnet and everything working. But to actually know that my unit's plugged in at home and I built it and put it together and I'm earning rewards. Um, and so I'll end on this note. It's like the best thing is, I can see my rewards physically accumulating there, and then I can say, okay, transfer this to my MetaMask or Trust Wallet, and then keep it in Fula, switch it to another crypto I love, I don't know, like Cosmos, ADA, or even maybe switch it to Fiat, pay off my credit card bills, right? So it's very much store to earn. So, okay, so with uh, the first piece is, mm -hmm. um, you're you're currently just in Canada with this tool, or do you have it oh, all no, over no. the world? So we had a pre-sales campaign through Indiegogo. Thanks, yeah. Indiegogo, for all your help. And we sold um, just shy of a 1,000 units globally across the world. So we have over 30 units in Australia, over 20 in South America, um, lots in Europe, Canada, almost 100. So we have 900 nodes across the world distributed, physically decentralized, and they're all coming online onto testnet now. So... If you're in a country that doesn't have these nodes, are there any limitations? So with these nodes, you can elect to join pools. So at the moment, we have um, we get one in Europe and one in the like North America. And as we get more and more nodes coming online, more and more pools will be created. But you can elect to create your own pool. So, I mean, it's sort of taking on its life of its own. But one of our community members has turned their FX blocks into a Minecraft server. Right, which is not our original <laughs> intention, but I love it. So for people that need, for instance, like they're gaming, they want that low latency, and maybe they're gaming um, in a sort of collaborative sort of game, like Fortnite or something, they could make their own pools of FX blocks nodes much more geographically connected in with each other. But if you're in Australia, you can join um, like the closest pool to you, and that's of no issue at all. And in fact, we had people during testnet who are like just on the border of which pool that they should connect to. So people in like Norway, Sweden, were first trying to connect into this pool and then they figured actually, no, they actually belong to this pool. So that was kind of fun to figure out. But um, we are going to, yeah, the geography, the geography is going to be changing over time, but you can choose small localized pools, but your data is always um, redundantly saved to multiple nodes at all times. Okay, so if something happens to the device, then you're, you're good. Yes, that's okay. exactly the thing. So, and the other nice thing is if you have an FX block, which I hope we'll have to get you one, <laughs> but you know, I have mine at home. So you, I could share a terabyte with you and you can share a terabyte with me reciprocally and we don't pay for storage. So we can each get a terabyte of that additional storage from each other reciprocally, which is also really important. It can alleviate a lot of those storage costs people are incurring. Yeah. Okay. And what are, what are these units? What do they run? Yeah, so we have two available on Shopify right now. I believe I'm in the home of Shopify itself. Mm -hmm. um, so we have one that's retailing for 400 USD, and this is called an FX Blocks Lite. It still comes with a terabyte, and it has um, a chip in it. It's called an RK3588, and it actually has sort of a low, not a high-functioning GPU, but it has a, the equivalent of what an Android phone has it. So it actually has quite a lot of compute abilities right within it. So that one's 400 USD. Um, this, and this could change with the you know, economies of scale, but right now that's where it's at. And then we have one that's closer to um, 800 USD. That is an Ethereum staking edition. So we've partnered with Rocket Pool, and you can use your device to, um, you know, create pools and then actually stake Ethereum for much lower amount than the 32, whatever they required originally. 
Um, but the nice thing is, yes, you can buy this device. It really takes a lot of that friction and the techie stuff out of it, and you just it's plug and play. But the really exciting thing is, and this is what I can't wait for, is that with any sort of Linux-based hardware, you can repurpose this old hardware, put our IPFS-based software protocols and blockchain protocols on top of it, and be running your own node with repurposed hardware. So it could be like zero cost if you've got the knowledge, or if there's a no code, that can be like a coding lab or a maker space that puts the resources together, um, or you can purchase one off Shopify. So what would people repurpose, repurpose it for? I just mean like, I mean, this is still like a developing idea. I mean, our focus has been on getting these units out and making sure that the nodes that we need are distributed across the world. But, you know, back to this uh, idea of like developing nations. Let's say there's um, like a coding school that has a strong internet connection and has like, you know, consistent electricity and so forth. They could um, find an old Xbox unit or some sort of some sort of hardware that has a yeah, like that Linux underpinning, and then they can get that thing online instead of purchasing an FX blocks. So this is really exciting because it can like yeah, instead of this hardware going to landfill, it can actually be turned into a money making storage node. So the possibility is endless. I mean, we see people doing this with smartphones, like using smartphones to old smartphones to provide compute. But the idea is you want something that's low power, that like doesn't have huge power consumption needs. And that can um, and it is, that is always on, so that's the idea. Oh, okay, and so your device is one of these, like a lower powered. Yes, so we, um, it doesn't take much. Especially uh, my electricity is hydro powered, so it's like environmentally friendly too, but very low power to usage, and it's just always plugged on, plugged in in my office at home, and I can hear it whirring away. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, people say, "Let's why not use a laptop? Run a node on a laptop." Well, if you shut that thing off and you go on the train or something, then that node. It's potentially coming offline, right? So you want that consistency and uptime. Well, this is a really interesting, um, I'd say, use case and uh, for Deepin. Yes. And you know, it sounds like you're really busy doing a lot of different projects uh, alongside this one. So I was kind of wondering, from your thoughts, um, what industries or sectors do you think, if you had more bandwidth? that yeah. you'd be trying to tackle with Deepin? Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah. So my founders and my company is, is hyper-focused on consumer-facing. So they want the consumers to be providing the storage and be the beneficiary of the storage. We're building consumer-facing applications. Um, but that's on purpose. That's by design. Because if the consumers all purchase one of these, get online, start providing storage, using the storage, then when there's one of these on every person's desk, or even, you know, not every process, but as we go, we can then turn to enterprise, turn to software as a service type of companies and say, hey, use our back end instead. You know, um, instead of using every, like all the services of AWS, which start free, or they say, you know, the more AWS resources you use, the cheaper it becomes. But, you know, and I see a lot of startups, they start with AWS free credits, and then they, um, this is great, it only pings, like they use Lambda, it only pings when the server needs it. But all of a sudden, now you scale to, thousand users, 10,000 users, and you're trying to store all of your users' information and data on the platform so that they can search a hashtag or something, right? It becomes really cost prohibitive to keep um, your SaaS application online. So, that, so yeah, consumer focus initially, but then it actually is that back end for B2B or enterprise as we go. So you said what sectors, I'll just touch briefly on, I mean, there's this, this decentralized energy can be a large focus of Deepin. Um, like wireless, for instance, like we talk about weather and nodes and actual um, like mobility, smart cities, these types of things. But um, with decentralized AI, I think that is like the low hanging fruit. So everyone's focused on generative AI. You and I were just talking about chat GTP. Well, those are being sold to developers and hence to consumers as loss leaders. So right now it's like you pay 0 0.0010 cents per input token. And if you're user generates a paragraph answer out of it, your the company is paying for that many output tokens and it seems really dandy, but then actually those companies who are letting you use ChatGTP in your offering have to turn around and pay the cloud companies and those cloud companies have to turn around and pay NVIDIA for GPU provisions and so forth. And so some so decentralized AI I think is absolutely the focus for two reasons. Number one, we have huge amounts of data being generated. So video, imagery, generative AI, and there's actually a shortage of compute. 
I mean, I was just in um, UK on an AI trade mission for Canada, and that was just the talk of the town. There's just been a hockey stick curve in uh, demand for AI and the amount of data being generated, but then how do you actually provide all the compute and keep up with that? And then if someone, for instance, you know, back to Cywin, the agricultural technology we're um, building, someone is collecting huge amounts of video imagery. I mean, all these companies say it to me, all the ones working with ArcGIS and um, Esri and everything, we collect all of this video imagery. We're just using one tiny part of it. Where can we store the rest of this? Because we might want to come back and build an algorithm or a computer vision solution on the video data we already collected. So for instance, they'll say, I have a garbage truck it has a sensor on it, it's collecting information about stop signs. Right now, I don't care about that data, but what if I want to come back and build an algorithm about that data? So keeping it in your Microsoft Azure, it's pretty cost effective right now, but you might want to put that in cold storage or storage where you don't need it right now, but you do want to retrieve it later. So I think some of these deepened projects are allowing that, just that storage component, but they're also offering GPU compute. So instead of, if you want to spin up an instance and train a model, build a model, deploy a model. You don't have to go to centralized tech to borrow their GPU infrastructure. You can go to these decentralized ones who say, we've got customers who have idle hardware sitting around an idle GPU, and then you can spin up an instance and use their decentralized compute. So that's like absolutely where I see it going. Um, and then even just like, you know, this Filecoin Foundation, I'm very fond of Protocol Labs, and they want to save humanity's data forever. So if there was something like a genocide and there was Reuters or the AP or someone took photos and imagery and maybe we don't, it's too traumatic to view now, but down the line that should be documented. So they, they are looking at that or even um, if you want to find a cure for a rare disease or a new molecule, there's the Bacalao project. So can we all use our excess compute or idle computing power on our laptops or home and not donate that, but essentially like make it available to Stanford researchers or whomever who want to and need that compute power to find that new cure or that new molecule, and then be rewarded tiny bits in, in you know, for that provision, but knowing you're doing something great for humanity. So decentralized AI could go in a lot of different directions, but for sure, just based on where is the demand, there's a demand for compute and storage related to AI products for sure now, and it's just going to get worse. Yeah, I mean that's that's an that's an interesting, I guess, way to go about it, optimizing compute mm -hmm. basically through crowdsourcing, really, mm -hmm. in a way. So that that does make sense, yeah. um, at least until Microsoft gets all its nuclear power plants. I think they're buying some. Oh yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if it's Microsoft. I should probably stop saying these big brand names. Yeah, we're giving but, them a bunch of free advertising. You know, well, not even that. I, I haven't even verified any of this information. <laughs> but but uh, even I'll just, it's one thing on NVIDIA. It's like, yes, they're making these GPU chips. It's what everybody is purchasing and using. But it's not necessarily the best chip design for AI. So you actually need what they call these neural processing units, NPUs. Um, and they're much better and much more efficient and much more cost efficient. And they can be done at the CPU level. So again, Function Lens FX Blocks has some really interesting compute inside it. And I'd love to see what our community can actually harness that to do. Yeah, I mean, the, at least the conferences of this year, um, I'd say in the Web3 space, hmm. a lot of the speakers have been saying that, you know, blockchain is the decentralizing force and... Um, sort of the counter to AI's natural position, which is centralizing, is how they were positioning it. Yeah. Um, just because like how, like what's available now and how it's being used now and by what mm -hmm. companies it's, that are using it now, mm -hmm. it is, tends to be functioning as centralized. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people haven't been able to afford, I mean, there's, be, there's been a big now availability and cost effective compute that people can run localized nodes now much more effectively. That wasn't an option until recently, right? So there's the supply side, factors are changing and demand is also changing. So DPIN is, um, yeah, well positioned. <laughs> so how do you see, um, I guess, DPIN evolving over the next you know, five years? Do you see a lot of the legacy groups starting to build in tokens into their, mm -hmm. their networks and, and their plans or do you think it's not even on their radar and they don't care? I think we have to be really careful. I think in Web3 and blockchain, there's been a lot of um, push, right? Like let's push NFTs and push the needs of um, artists or push the needs for wallets and DeFi and all these things. 
But just like all technology, there has to be demand. I mean, if the consumers don't want it and are not going to pay for it and not going to try it out and not pick it up, it's all for naught, mm -hmm. right? So where do I see it going? Um, I see it has to just sort of follow, for initially, at least to bootstrap these networks and make them useful and have utility and longevity, we have to really look at what the needs are. And at Function Line, we've nailed that. There needs to be personalized storage. I mean, right now, with Apple or Google, if you get two terabytes in Apple or five terabytes in Google One, it's going to cost you 30 bucks a month. It's not too bad. But the minute you drive, go up to six terabytes of storage, like your, your friends and your family and your genealogy trees and the videos and your camcorder digitizations, you're all, all of a sudden 30, 70 bucks a month, $200 a month. So it gets really cost prohibitive just to use today's SaaS, right? So we've got to follow where the business models actually make sense. And yes, you can build all the developer tooling in the world, but if the developers aren't going to use it, it doesn't matter. So there's this issue in blockchain and Web3 where a lot of stuff's actually just like B2B and developer tooling, right? Um, but recently, like Solana's made this Blinks thing where you can, and again, like I'm really trying to suss that one out, but Blinks is really trying to bring that friction down and allow users to interact with Web3 and everything, right in Twitter or right or X or right on these applications. Um, but, um, sorry, what was the question again? And just where Deepin will win, right? Well, not that oh, it will oh, win, but like yeah. where, you know, like where do you see, like right now it's really new, I would say. Yeah. It's, it's emerging. Yeah. Um, that's where I would put it on the hype curve. It's, it's, it's very hype much, curve, in, yes. you know, in the beginning part of it. Um, and some, some use cases are, are starting to come out. Right, right, right. So, yes. You know, where do you see it in five years? And do you think the, you know, the, the legacy right. groups are going to do anything with it? Because they already have the demand and there's, yeah. there's no reason for them to do it um, because they've already paid the, the, the costs to set up their right. infrastructure. And unless they start losing a lot of customers, you know, which they might just lower their prices in order to deal with mm -hmm. that. Because I think that's also another another piece to it. Yeah. Like there's, because everything's an oligopoly pretty much in the infrastructure world, mm -hmm. um, including, I would include networks in there too. It's a very good question, um, yeah. Is that they get to set the prices. Right. And the prices only go up. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's twofold for sure. And I, I, mean, I was actually asked this by an investor at Collision, you know, well, AWS or whomever has this huge amounts of money sitting on so much cash and they can just put up new data centers and lower their prices, right? Number one, that's a race to the bottom. Um, and it can't ever really get to be free when you're needing large data sets and purchasing hardware from others. But um, I'm actually going to present this case later today. So there's a company called Pocket Network. I love this idea. So it's part of Deepin, but it's under almost a sub term under the pin called RPC, remote procedure calls. So, you know, there's going to be all these blockchain networks and they need to, I mean, interoperability is commonly thrown around term, but they need to be able to call upon and query each other or be able to query each other's data or holdings. But then also we need to be able to pull from existing Web2 databases or, you know, sensors and things like that. So we're going to need these remote procedure call entities. So Pocket Network was saying, well, what the community is starting to say, why don't we run an LLM on a Pocket Network provision compute environment instead of Amazon Web Services? And they're, so they're starting to do a deep dive on the prices. So they look at what does it cost to store and pull and retrieve stuff from AWS to make a query engine on Llama. And they're saying, you know, we can get it as cheap as Amazon or cheaper, but it actually doesn't need to be cheaper than AWS because there's so many other um, components that it brings to the table in terms of data privacy and security. And so I could see, um, yeah, that being an example. So I'm just really bullish on these companies that are providing compute. So I love like a cache. I'm watching um, Pocket Network. Um, and so, yeah, there's a few of these I'll be talking about later today. But um, yeah, that's where I see. It. I, I mean, I mean like, I don't think it's only cost. I think that's one. Yeah, that's one component. Um, I definitely do think that, like, as a consumer, you're being used by a lot of these service organizations mm -hmm. based on they get to charge you and they get the profit from you at the same time, yes. but not based on your dollars giving in. 
profiting on you for like your data and, and usage and, and other reasons. Showing you And ads. so I do <laughs> think that those are other uh, variables in, yeah. in the com competitive landscape. So, I mean, I, I don't think it's only price, mm -hmm. but I mean, like, that's what you do as a big organization to try to stave off competition is you right. know, create a barrier, an economic barrier. Yes. But some of the, these companies, if they advance in Web3 and head of the actual Web3 native projects, it could be cannibalizing their own businesses, right, mm -hmm. in some cases. So some of them are being wary of that. It's not obvious to them because they may actually cannibalize some of their offerings. Okay, cool. Well, um, I could be sitting here all day and talking to you about Deepin, um, yeah, but same. we have a conference later today right. that we'll be uh, listening to you on stage. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to shift to the fun questions. Okay, I'm ready for so, it. And of course, if Deepin is the answer for any of these, <laughs> that's perfectly fine. Yeah, it's top of mind. Um, so the first question is, um, what books are you currently reading or that's inspiring or influencing your work? And I get not everybody reads. So mm -hmm. if you're listening to a book, if you're listening to a podcast, you know, whatever, it can be in that category too. Yeah. All right. Um, so on the fiction side, there's recently a book that's come out called The Oracle. And it's um, the author is a professor at Cornell. He's also part of Chainlink Labs. So it's actually, it's actually quite hilarious. And it's about... Basically, you know, this person who's developing smart contracts and developing all this blockchain technology, but then he actually becomes the focus of a hit. There's a smart contract out to have him assassinated, and he can't um, go against like the Web3 tenants to have this hit taken off of his head, right? So it's this funny dilemma. So I'm currently reading that and really enjoying it. Um, I'm actually also going through some really interesting psychotherapy and executive coaching to just really enhance my leadership abilities. And so I'm reading a book called um, The Happiness Trap by Russ Harris. And that's just been an absolute game changer. So I'm doing also the, the worksheets that come with it that really help you sort of break down problems and um, understand really what your true values are. So I've been just done a whole like value reset and that's been just unbelievably. I mean, I think going through the bull market and then going through the bear market and the stress of building our company and putting Testnet together like really took a toll um, on all founders. And most companies, the good ones didn't even survive the bear site bear market right so the ones that made it through like ourselves and we had to be very capital efficient and so yeah that's been really helpful um just in making my quality of life better and mental health really strong um but podcasts you know i love to listen to like diary of a ceo or the wall street millennial and you just learn about these companies that literally making millions billions and then just tanked or they were fraud at the end of the day so i love to really learn about those like big you know examples well, we don't talk enough about the companies after they've ipo'd Yes. Yeah. After I mean, they, most of them shouldn't have IPO'd in the first like place. Like after they exited, yeah. there's so many of them after the exits and kind yeah. of the, the VC tour of talking yeah. about it, you never hear about them again. Yeah, no. And I'm really curious right now about mergers and acquisitions. Like, as I said, one of my companies is going through Next AI and they've been coaching us on that. So you don't always just want to be acquired or have that small exit and function line that will never be an option for function line. But for these smaller companies, you know, how can you build technology and become really competitive for an interesting acquisition or sell of parts of your technology? Like this is unpopular, yeah. um, you know, also because I'm in Canada and maybe I shouldn't say this, but we are more of an M&A market. Um, yes. And I would generally, if someone asked me if they should IPO, if they're IPOing on the TSX, I would recommend against that. Hmm. If you are strong enough to IPO in the U.S., then you can double list. But if you look yeah. at the track record of companies that it's a slow death on the TSX. Yeah. Um, you know, Shopify didn't, they listed in the U S mm -hmm. and a lot of the other larger ones, but a lot of the ones that end up on the TSX or TSX venture, yeah. they end up penny stocks and you know, they, they get obliterated. And I would say, I don't think that's founder friendly. I think it's good for investors though. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, I don't think all companies need to IPO or go public right away. And I think sometimes, it, especially within Web3, it's just a whole different path, right? You have your testnet, mainnet, token generation event, and you are essentially, in essence, like a public company because these are publicly sold, um, you know, crypto tokens and shares of these companies and so forth. But um, Well, 
I was at uh, Tech Exit in Toronto last year, uh-huh. and uh, the speaker that they had there was actually going through the M and A, or sorry, the IPO track record of Canada for tech companies, and it yeah. does not look like it's a good idea. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. I think we need to really take a look at how. I think the, at the end of the day, just how do you become a ruthless revenue generating company that's sustainable? That's got to be it. And I think this whole focus on um, intellectual property as well. There's IPON where they're also, I think, forcing lots of companies early stage to start looking at IP and getting these patents. And I think sometimes it's a distraction. And there's some companies that, like, who make these beautiful machine learning models and things like that that don't necessarily need to be creating intellectual property right now. And obviously, I'm a huge fan of open source, right? So how do we create open source technology but still actually um, charge for it where necessary? So charge enterprises for using these open source stacks. But yeah, I think with Canadian companies, we have to be very aggressive. We need to be aggressive in our fundraising. Um, we need to raise larger seed rounds. I think lots of companies are raising small seed rounds and then just tapering out or not then hitting high well, seed rounds. Well, I like, again, when I, my comment about the, the IPO, yeah. I mean, I don't think anything is all or nothing. I mm-hmm. think every case is specific. So yes. it depends on the company, it depends sure. on what they're doing, depends on you know, a whole range of factors. Yeah. Um, but to kind of be chasing that immediately when you're, when you yeah. haven't even really established, yeah. um, which there's many, uh, Canadian companies and they're not small, you know, they're, yeah. they're doing well for Canadian companies. They're not small, mm-hmm. you know, they're doing their 20 mil plus ARR, but they're still chasing that. But you know, when you compare it to like American companies and they're not competing on the same the same level and then they end up getting bought by PE and taken private and then they end up in America anyways. Yeah, I've seen, especially some of them take huge amounts of non-dilutive funding and grant money from the federal government and then land it being sold to the US and I don't know how we capitalize on that funding. Um, Oh, for sure. Um, Oh, it's going to be interesting to see um, how things shake up with the, the new rules. Um, but I had talk about that too much, so I should <laughs> probably move on. So uh, my next question is, uh, what tech tools or productivity hacks are you using? Like, wh- what can't you live without? For me, it's my calendar, which is very basic. <laughs> yeah. But without it, I it just I'm always missing meetings. I'm always forgetting people. Like, if you're not in my calendar, it's really difficult. Yes. So. Yeah. So no, I am a huge fan of, on the calendaring side, Calendly. I'm a huge fan of Calendly. I think it's so, it's just an amazing tool. And uh, also was created by a black founder and it's been enormously successful. And I just love to watch its journey and, um, and use it very judiciously. I mean, very, very much. Um, for me, you know, it's interesting because our, my company competes with the Googles of the world and the Microsoft of the world where, the, where, where there's these cloud collaborative tools, right? But I... Google Slides and Google Docs is my mainstay. I create everything in Google Docs and then use the comments section, you know, to uh, to speak to my founders and to get things done. But, you know, in, in Web3 and crypto, it's all about Telegram and Discord. And again, it's not shifting back to Twitter. So, and I do love Twitter, even though I think I'm being paid, paying for it and the engagement and things like that haven't been as strong since it's been taken over. But um, I actually need help in the productivity tools department. I think I've got a lot going on, both my personal life and in my work life and some productivity tools would be helpful. So maybe I'll pull on you, Josh, offline <laughs> <laughs> to figure some of that out. Yeah. Um, so uh, on the conversation of tools, is there any cool or interesting AI tool that you're playing with right now? Ooh. Okay. So, um, so, yeah, so there's a f- couple. So one of the companies I'm coaching called Grain Data Solutions has been uh, charged by the government with uh, building a a large language model with like a a RAG component. So they want farmers to be able to either query their own information from their farms or just information in general and be able to get Ontario-specific information about how they battle that weed or what herbicide can they use or when should they harvest. So we're looking at we're looking at all the different components and looking at what we could be using. But I'm really impressed with Llama Index. So I really like how you could build, as we're referencing it before, like a query engine over top of a data set or a whole large amount of internet websites and so forth. So I really like the looks of that um, with AI productivity. And then on the computer vision side, so one of the companies I'm coaching, Cyber.ai, has built a no-code AI platform for developing computer vision 
model. So you develop the model with it and then you deploy it as well with a customer facing UI. So we're obviously looking at some of the competition in that space. So like V7 Labs, for instance, um, Encord. So I'm really interested in these tools on the AI side that can help build computer vision models and then even actually use AI to tag and annotate the data in the first place. That kind of blows my mind because it's like, how can the machine know what to tag? I'm supposed to be annotating and tagging it to teach the machine. But it's this idea of like, um, yeah, where the, machine, you know, the system's learning from itself. Okay. So those are some of the ones I'm watching. Yeah, cool. Um, next question, health and wellness. Okay. So do you have any routine to stay balanced or focused or some sort of process? Organic could be a tool that helps you. Yeah, so I touched earlier on um, Russ Harris and the happiness trap and some of the uh, psychotherapy I'm going through currently. And that um, wasn't, yeah, so I think my mental state really reached a peak. Um, I have six children and I just recently, my youngest are two and a half year old identical twins. And so that I think I probably had some sort of postpartum mental things that came up that I wasn't really as aware of as I should have been. And so I think I've, as I said earlier, taken a complete reset. So I'm being really, really candid here because I think it's important to know that, you know, I work with neurodivergent founders. I am probably, I am one myself. Um, I haven't in the past dealt with stress properly. I probably have had even like substances usage that hasn't been good for me. So I've had a complete reset. I focus now on um, therapy under psychotherapists, um, psychiatrists, taking the right medication. I think it's important to be diagnosed, not be self-medicating because I've been part of that before. So medicated properly and then sleep. Oh my goodness. I met um, someone from Ally Ventures, Blake. Shout out to Blake. He was our first mentor and he always talked about sleep hygiene. I was like, what the heck is that? <laughs> but it is so important. So yeah, sleep and also just really realigning my values. So focusing on you know, my family and my children and having good relationships with my founders is so important. Yeah. Yeah. The sleep one is just hard. Yeah. You know, we're all so busy. Yeah. You know, yes, in an ideal world, I would love. Yeah. And Netflix to, is so bingeable. <laughs> it is. It is. And YouTube. And, you know, the problem is I've developed a bad habit, Had which you. is I like to turn Netflix on while I'm eating. Oh, and yeah. And if I do that, then it just, well, we could just watch a little bit more after I finish eating. Yeah. And so, like, you know, it, it, it screws my schedule up. It definitely yeah. causes my sleep time to be readjusted. Yeah, no, for sure. And actually, so part of what I'm go the work I'm doing with my doctors is that I had OHIP paid, which I'm so grateful for OHIP and how all the services I was offered. And so I went through mindfulness training course, like a four week course, just focused on mindfulness. And I also used to think that's a bunch of Huey or I thought it was yeah, eating without digital <laughs> influences around you. I thought that was mindfulness, but it's been absolutely incredible to actually learn and then to actually have tools that help reground you and make sure that you're being mindful and then living your life in a mindful manner is it's like the world is like disneyland again it's just so <laughs> exciting and uh so that's something i'd really encourage people to it's not just about yeah like really look into mindfulness and make sure you're not self-medicating or and just this, this dopamine from all this digital um hype you know you can it's, I, I don't have tiktok never will have it don't want to use it but the idea of just sitting there and letting it choose what to show you and scrolling on it for 45 minutes, an hour at a time. Um, it's just digital dopamine and people are addicted to it. And I think it's very well, There was uh, one company at Collision that was selling the sort of like, however it works, it gets rid of all the YouTube. Like you can use YouTube oh. without it feeding you stuff. Interesting. It's so that all you can do is you go in the search bar and you only see what you want. So it doesn't trick you by getting you to click on other oh, stuff because yeah. it's showing you up other things. You can yeah. go very specific for what you're looking for and what you want to see. Yeah. So you don't get caught up in the junk right. that, that's being added. And I'm just like, you know, like from an investment point of view, wasn't so interested. But as a consumer, I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like this would be great because yes. sometimes I'll go on, on YouTube, I'm looking for something mm -hmm. specifically and I'm like, oh, what's that? Oh, what did the president do? Oh, it's yeah. like, oh, aliens are where? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? it also, it can be in an echo chamber, yeah. right? So just you start on a tangent or streamlined thought process and it just keeps reinforcing that. And for people get trapped in these political partisan streams and so forth, 
Yeah, I've seen something on TechCrunch where they um, it says you're wasting X amount of your life right now by using these, oh, these sure. apps, right? Totally but it was it was an interesting tool. Um, yeah. I, I definitely got to check it out because I think just in terms of sometimes when I go on YouTube, I don't go in there just because I'm wasting time. I went in there for a reason and then I end up an hour later. It's like, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, and I think it's important that we build the decentralized version of YouTube. But it's like very, very costly to run YouTube to make it profitable. And you need really great transcoding um, companies. So that's why we're keen on Theta and LivePeer. <laughs> Good transcoding deep in companies to watch. Cool. So last question. So looking back on your experience, what advice would you offer to your younger self or to an aspiring entrepreneur and investor? How can they learn from maybe some of your, your mistakes or things that you've overcome? <sighs> Well, I have no regrets um, at all. I've just, I've had a very, very like exciting, fast paced last couple of years for sure. I think you just have to stay hungry and inquisitive and curious about how things work. And I think the most important thing is to teach yourself how to, to study and how to do your own due diligence. So if you're reading, you know, a white paper or choosing to invest in something or um, you're joining a startup, you know, how can you use your own skills to do a deep dive into that and know what in fact you're, you know, getting yourself into. So I would just say, and stay curious, you know, keep learning. And then, you know, like I went back to school m many years after I completed my post-secondary education to learn more about AI, you know, so I think just really stay on top of that and be optimistic, but authentic and true to yourself. Um, yeah, I think there's this fad of being uh, like toxically optimistic all the time, you know, and I don't think that's realistic sometimes. Yeah. All right, cool. So this is the part where you can plug whatever you like. If you, <laughs> if you have some social media things you want people to follow, you yes. want to talk about function line, you want to give an announcement, this is, this is, this is the time. All right, sure. Well, thank you so much for having me, Josh. Um, my ask would be that people jump into the function land community. We are the function landers. We are aiming to have 20,000 Twitter followers you know, way before the end of this year. So if you're not already following Function Land on Twitter, please do so. Um, also our Telegram, we'd love to have you in our Telegram. We have a main channel and then a support channel. Um, if you haven't already purchased Netflix blocks or you already have one and need help getting yours on board, you know, well, you're welcome to reach out to us individually or ask the community to help you get your node on board so you can get earning. Um, yeah, and of course, just yeah, keep up and support the Function Land activities, and uh, that's all I ask. Thank you. Oh, awesome! Thank you for doing this, Kate, and um, I'll see you later this afternoon at the event. All right, looking forward to it. Thank you, Josh. You can find information about the Candid Capital podcast on the website, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Episodes can be found on Spotify and other podcast platforms. A quick reminder that this is infotainment and is not intended to be professional advice, malicious, or hateful. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not represent those of employers, partners, and their subsequent connected private and public associations or organizations. We canned it. I hope you understand it. Your business growth, we planned it. Yeah, this ain't for show. We stamped it. Yeah, yeah. No FOMO. Everyone come join. No solo. This all factual.